Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our second session of the investigative journalism workshop. Today, we have Ron Nixon from the Associated Press joining us to teach. Um, thank you so much to Ron for joining us. You guys feel free to unmute and ask questions as we go, or you can drop them in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on things. So Ron, you can go ahead. Thank you. So, well, good after, well, oh, oh, sorry, a little long day. Good evening, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. And uh, thanks MVJ for uh, having me, inviting me to, to do this session. Um, and so I know that you guys had, um, IRE in yesterday to sort of give you a broad overview of uh, investigative reporting. And um, so now you should, should have a really uh, good grasp. What I'm gonna do is sort of dig a little deeper into uh, the weeds here. And that is like from going from broad, like broad overview of watchdog reporting to basically how do you do it from start to finish? Um, and so I want to share a story that I did a few years ago to actually it's more than a few years ago. It's it's like back in 1996. So uh, some of you probably weren't even alive in 96. But um, so I'm going to share this and um, just give you an anatomy of an investigation here and then again always you know feel free to ask any questions that you you have to so this basically is an investigation that i did at the at the rono times uh the rono times is the uh, medium-sized newspaper at least it was in roanoke virginia and so uh i had to go cover a hearing for a friend who out on uh, maternity leave uh, and so I had to go cover this uh, county council budget meeting. And if you've ever covered a budget meeting, um, it's if I had a choice between covering a budget meeting and a root canal, I would take the root canal any day of the week because uh, a budget meeting is the absolute most boring thing that you could sit through. But uh, as I was sitting here, uh, I they were talking about the budget for the county, um, this Henry County, uh, Virginia, about 45 minutes south of Roanoke, had once been uh, the home of big textile plants, but now it was pretty much barren. Um, and, you know, so they were looking at economic development and things like that to like most poor rural areas that have lost industry over time. So anyway, I'm sitting there and I'm listening to them. They've handed out the budget. So other reporters are sitting there as well and they go into executive session. So I'm sitting there just looking at the budget and two numbers just stand out to me. Um, I see the legal fees had jumped from one year to the, the next. I do a quick calculation in Excel and the jump is about 200%. So that catches my eye like why is this poor rural county um spending this much on legal fees so i kind of like you know bluffed the folks after the hearing to say okay what outside counsel did you guys hire because i know they didn't spend that money on hiring new attorneys so it had to be outside counsel so they told me so then i went and looked up what this firm but they wouldn't tell me what the firm did uh, and why, what it was for. So I went and looked up the farm, far, firm in Martindale Hubble. Now, granted, I have a picture here of martindalehubble.com, but back in 96, it was not on the web, so I had to go to the library. So young people, a library is like this big building and it has like books and stuff in it and it's mainly free. Um, so went in there, looked up, Mardell Hubble has a list of all the law firms in the US. And I looked up this law firm and it did environmental work primarily. So I filed a freedom of information request um, the very next day, uh, the state freedom of information request. Now state laws 
allow you, some states, not all, but state laws, unlike the federal law, allow you to review the documents before they actually copy them for you. So I reviewed the document and it turns out that the federal government, the EPA uh, and the FBI was investigating uh, them for polluting, for violating the Clean Water Act. But there was something else in there that just kind of stood out at me too. There was a vendor um, that they were paying a, a ton of money to uh, that I noticed in the files. And so, but the vendor was in Roanoke. It wasn't in Martinsville where Henry in Henry County. So I just drove over to the address and it turned out that it was one of those, those places where you can get like a box, but have a physical address. So then I learned, well, the FBI was actually uh, investigating in what, what turned out that the Henry County Public Service Authority, the head of it, this guy named Sid Cloward, was, had set up this fake company and he was paying money to this fake company and using the money to pay off his three mistresses. You can see the three mistresses there. Three mistresses, not one, not two, but three mistresses. Uh, and Sid ultimately ended up in jail. Uh, you can see here that he set up this fictitious, fictitious company uh, and did all of this stuff with the money here. And so Sid actually went to jail twice uh, for tax evasion. So I show you that because it is, when normally when people think of investigative reporting, they think of you, you do this massive investigation that takes, you know, 30 years and that, you know, there's all of this, but actually most, most of the time it's not. Most of the time it's actually just what you, what you saw here. And, and that is an investigation that starts with, with a tip. And then building on that tip, following the paper trail to get to this, it took me actually four days to do this story four days it it wasn't it didn't take a bunch of years and i was also you know a beat reporter at the time so that's just a quick example of what you can do once you know like what the um how to actually get at records right and so i'm going to talk a, a lot about just following the, the the paper trail and how do you do an investigation from start to finish here. So apologies, let me get this, this thing set up here. Uh, and then I can get to my, the actual presentation. Uh, God, where am I? Ron, it looks like your screen is frozen. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's what I'm, uh, my, it's frozen and I'm trying to, to figure Gosh. out. Like, Apologies, folks. Um, man. So let me let me do this. Just let me log out and log right back in. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Absolutely, no worries. Be right back. Okay. Maybe we can all introduce ourselves and get to know each other. Absolutely. And Della, I do see your question. Yes, we will have the webinar up on YouTube um, within the next few days. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So while we're waiting, hi, everybody. I'm Devin. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. All. Hi, Devin. Devin, what's your story? Um, I'm an Army brat. So <laughs> my father got out of the army when I was, I believe around six, um, spent a few years as a journalist in Savannah, Georgia, and then he got back in. So he is still currently serving. He's coming up on his retirement. Hey guys, I'm back. Can you see me? Yes. Okay, hey. great. Great. Welcome back. Okay, thank you. And again, apologies for that. All right. So. I have a little quiz for you guys. So um, everybody's familiar with Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? Yes? Yes. Yes? Okay. 
So tell me what you see here. I just want to just get a, a sense of, of what you see here. Someone breaking an Andrew kind of? I see gold <laughs> and four bears. Oh yeah. So um, so yeah, let me go. So I give my students this when I, I what when I taught at Howard University, I would tell the students, okay, tell me what you see here. And unfortunately, most of them are really young and they didn't even know what Goldilocks and the Three Bears were, which is, that's a, that should be a crime right there. But the, the thing is that this is about like looking and seeing a story when other people aren't seeing a story, similar to what I just talked about with that, that, that thing in, in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, and here, where other people see this cute nursery rhyme, what I see is breaking and entering because Goldilocks, she broke into the bear's house, right? And then she, she ate their food and then broke their chairs. And then the fourth is inaccurate framing. So they have the bears menacing over her, but you don't get the impression that she's in their house. And so they're in the right there. So a lot of this is simply looking at stories in a different way than what other people are looking at. them, And that is the essence of like investigative reporting. Here is a story that we did a few years ago. And this young man was walked out of jail after we, after we did the story. Uh, and I'll circle back to that, that later. So let me get into like, what makes a good investigative reporter? The ability to think critically, the ability to think creatively, be able to organize vast amounts of information, developing a document state of mind. A document state of mind comes from two of my heroes, Barlett and Steele. Um, and they were reporters for the Philadelphia Inquirer for years. Uh, and they, they did the type of work that I wanted to do is like this, these big, um, sweeping investigations into everything from nuclear waste to free trade. Uh, but they have this thing called a document state of mind, which you should always assume that the document that you want is somewhere out there. You just have to find it. You also need to be able to understand freedom of information laws, both state and federal, to be able to regularly cultivate sources and this is something that journalists uh, overall, not just investigative reporter, that we are not as good as this as we think that we are. Because <coughs> source cultivation is constant. Cultivating sources, <coughs> excuse me, is like having insurance before you get into an accident. You don't get into an accident and then try and get GEICO, right? You have it before you get into an accident. Sourcing is the same way. You have the sources before you need the sources. And also the thing about cultivating and, and basically uh, source retention is not calling the sources like your cousin who shows up every 10 years asking to borrow from money, right? So you want to treat the sources humanely you know, it's okay to send a card to someone and say, hey, you know, congratulations that your kid graduated college or high school, or my condolences, there's a death in your family. Uh, and then the last thing that that is really key, and particularly, you know, I don't think this is a problem for uh, veterans, because, you know, I know the entire time I was in the military, I was always comfortable with being uncomfortable. So, but as a investigative reporter, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. That is, people are not going to like you. And if you're in it for people to like you, then this is not the area that you want to want to focus on. So how do we get ideas uh, for an investigation? Reading. As journalists, I don't think we read enough. We don't read, um, you know, even with the newspaper, and I'll show you examples later of how I got an idea for an investigation by reading another newspaper because the reporter didn't see it. Uh, reports, um, all sorts of you know books, other documents. Personal observation. 
you know, I ended up doing a story about the TSA after seeing them in um, a transportation hub here in DC, but away from the airport. Tip from sources. This is something that we always uh, look for tips to, that we get from sources, but make it easy for people to send things to you. Um, and just a word of caution, do not use WhatsApp, but if you wanna use Telegram or, um, or Signal, those are the best, or set up something like Proton Mail so that people can get information to you. Or if you work for an organization, uh, set up Secure Drop where people can send information without exposing themselves. Then to practice the, the two notebook rule, particularly if you're not an investigative reporter. Is everybody familiar with the two notebook rule? Yes? Give me a thumbs up if you are. Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing. Okay, so just give me a voice thing. How many? I people? don't I don't know it, Ron. I, I never heard of it. Okay. All right. So the two note notebook rule is this. As a beat reporter, you know, you go out to cover something, you have one notebook for the thing that you're covering. The other notebook is to write down things that you observe while you're there, but does not go into your daily story. So you write down stuff in your daily notebook, like, okay, I'm here, I'm covering this fire, and this, you know, the fire killed this many people, and the people lost their home, you go back and you file your story. But in that second notebook, you're noted, you're writing down, like, how long did it take the fire to get there? How many people did the fire you have? Like, what's the age of the fire truck? So you're building the, you, you're gathering the breadcrumbs for your investigation in that second notebook, even though you can't get to it at the moment. So that's why we call the, the two notebook rule. One to cover the thing that you're there to cover for the daily. The second one, write down observations to build on for an investigative report. Does that make sense? Yes? I think so, yeah. Okay, all right. Yes, all right. thank you, Ron. All right, so, the way that we work here at the AP, people are a little bit different, but for the team that I oversee, the thing that you have to meet these important uh, criteria, like will the story expose a hidden problem or tell our something new? Will it make a difference? Will anybody read it or listen to it? Is it time newsy? You know, who is being harmed and how? Who is responsible and can we prove it? And then how do we approach it? You know, do we have characters as a whistleblower, a victim, a bad guy, and paint a picture of the problem in detail? And again, you want to show this, not tell it. So the first thing to get to that point is to make that pitch to your editor. Here's some of the common problems with pitches. One, they're overly broad. When someone says, well, I want to investigate healthcare. Healthcare is massive. Like what part of healthcare do you want to investigate, right? Um, or someone says, you know, I want to take a look at, the surest way to get me to turn down a pitch is to say, I want to take a look at, because you have not thought through exactly what you want to take a look at. The second problem is that it's overdone. Like you see some, somebody did something on nursing homes. So immediately we'll, well, let's, let's, let us do something on a nursing home. Well, okay, but is that the thing that we need to do? Um, or has this been done before? Has it been overdone? Like we're constantly doing the same story over and over and over again. Third, it's a noun project. That means it's just like a mass, it's just, a, just like dolphins, right? Like you're not, you're not saying, what it is specifically that you want to do is just like dolphins or guns. Um, it's too small in scope or the potential impact. You know, we, we, we really want to have an impact to what we do. If I'm gonna give people time to do stuff, I do not wanna come back with something that people are, aren't even gonna read. It's too difficult to quanti qu quantify. Uh, which is that the data doesn't exist or that it's flawed. Now, sometimes the lack of data can actually be the story. But 
when you don't have the data for something, it's really hard to quantify that it is a problem. So you have to think about that when you're doing it. It's too complicated. If you can't summarize it, you know, I had an editor, and if you couldn't summarize it in like two sentences, then he, you didn't really have the story. Because if you have to explain your explanation, then it's like a joke, right? Like if you have to explain the joke, then it's not really funny. Um, simply, it simply won't fly in your newsroom. Now, most of you will work in, in, in smaller newsrooms and newsrooms that are in local. So if you're trying to like do a story about the Russian in, invasion of Ukraine and looking at the, the armament or something, probably won't fly unless there's some local tie to the armament or some local tie there. So that's why it won't fly in your newsroom. Not enough homework to back up the premise. That is a, it's a huge, 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 huge problem that someone uh, has an idea, but you haven't really spent enough time that I think that you have a mastery of the topic. And you ask a question that you won't be able to answer. Like, you know, are UFOs real? Like, how do you prove that? And just run, run. Why so, UFOs are real. But go ahead. I'm sorry. What was the question? Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I, I just, I wonder if you can kind of quantify how much of a story should you already sort of have reported before you start pitching, right? Like, like, and is it different if you're a freelancer? It's it's a good question. Uh, and, you know, I don't know if it should be any different if you're a freelancer. I mean, obviously, if you're a freelancer, you want to have everything nailed down because if you're pitching to uh, an editor, then they're getting tons of pitches. So you want to have yours where you've answered the question that you've anticipated the question that they're going to have and you've answered them and or at least tell them how you're going to answer those questions. So I think you should have a, a, a good amount of reporting done on the story. You don't have to have it all nailed down, but enough reporting to let me know that you've done your homework and that this is a story that we should run with, that I'm going to give you the time or the resources, or if you're a freelancer, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to invest in this person for them to go off and, and do this story. Thank you. Does that make sense? So some things to consider when you make this pitch, like how long is it gonna take and what are we gonna to have to expend in resources? Is this the best time to do this investigation? You know, and consider testing a little thesis before going all in. Like take a look at a, a city block and see if what you're looking at holds true there and then expand it to the city and then go, go wider. Or if you're only looking at the city, Test it out before you do, or get a slice of the data that you're looking at to see is your, if your thesis holds. Consider publishing it faster and in pieces. And what I mean by that is sometimes you'll see these big, massive three part series, right? And that's fine, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Um, what is the most famous investigation in American? history. Watergate. Eight. Watergate, exactly, right? Asked by a guy named Nixon. So with Watergate, you had two investigative reporters who wrote about the break-in and all the shenanigans that Nixon pulled off, correct? Right? Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. No, actually, that's not the case. Woodward and Bernstein were not investigative reporters. Uh, Woodward had been there nine months, and Bernstein was a screw up that they were, they were threatening to fire because he was actually supposed to be covering the Virginia legislature and weaseled his way into the Watergate coverage. And, and so, but they didn't do this as a series. And remember, Watergate happened in 1972. 
I know because I was in the first grade and people were calling me a crook and I didn't understand why people were calling me a crook. But anyway, those are my issues. I've, I've had therapy, so we're all good. Um, but, you know, Nixon didn't resign until 74. So they reported for a period of two years. This was not a series. This was just a series of stories that they reported over a two year period. So investigations don't always have to be these massive, you know, three part, four part series. They can be incremental investigations that you report things as you get them. And so that's why what I mean about publishing faster and in pieces. And a rule of thumb, I always tell reporters this, the longer it takes, the bigger the payoff has to be. So if I give you a year to do something, let's say I'm generous and I give you a year, but you know, you, you better be writing your Pulitzer acceptance speech if I give you that long to, to work on a project. It better be that good. Um, so the longer an editor gives you, the bigger the payoff needs to be for that, for that story. And then the last part here is, is critical because sometimes we aim here, but as we do more reporting, we see that we're not gonna get there. So you have to think at the beginning of the process, what is the minimal story that I can get, even if I can't get here, but I can still get here and it's still a really good story. It's not what we talked about, is not the scope that we talked about, but it's still going to be a really good story. And then sometimes, like, when do we just cut bait? Like, it's just not a story. So the process of pitching in six words or less, tell me, what is your story? What are you trying to answer? Will this story resonate with the audience? Will it hold someone accountable? You know, as we, we continue to talk about accountability and impact, does it have the potential to drive change? Again, impact. What medium do we use? Like, you know, I work at an organization where we do audio, visuals, and text. You know, what's the best format for that? Has someone else done this topic before? So when you give me a pitch, I want to see what else has been done as well because I don't want to replicate a story that's been done already. And then you need to tell me, why are we doing this if somebody else has done it? What's, why is our angle different or fresh? So getting a little deeper, I need a, a minimum of like one page with bullet points listing the findings. Who are the potential main characters? What are some of the scenes? What, what are the documents, data, audio? What, how much of this do you already have? And again, I want to know who else has covered this and provide me links to this so I can go through and look at what they've got versus what you're pitching to me. Once I've signed off, these are some keys for the reporting process. So organize your documents and interviews. This is critical because the the thing that you want to do at the, at the end, you don't want to have a big stack of documents and stuff and you're staring at a blank screen. And also when you get your documents, make sure that you make copies. Uh, and the reason is when I was a very young reporter, I took my documents with me to an interview and I was showing the guy the stuff because he was accused of embezzlement. So I got my documents. I'm showing the guy my documents. He grabs the documents and runs. So we're in a government building. So I'm running behind this guy who has my documents and he's running down the hallway. And so I'm chasing this dude with, with my documents. Oh my so always make copies of your documents and don't take the originals with you. Uh, try to record interviews because the thing that you do not want to say is for people to come back and say later, no, I didn't say that because, you know, your notes will not hold up. Don't wait until last minute to interview the subjects of your investigations. I know that people, that's, that's one of, I think, 
an endearing myth in journalism is that we need to wait until we've got everything and do the big reveal. Well, one, you don't know if you're gonna be able to talk to that person again. So get what you need at the point where you, and then you can always follow up, but get as much as you can from that person and let the person know what you have. People should not be surprised when they see the story run or hear the story or watch the story. Right as you go, I hammer this into the heads of the reporters here, right as you go. As soon as you finish an interview, write it up. Because again, you don't wanna wait until the very end. You've got all these documents and you got this data and you sit down and you're looking at the computer screen and it's just daunting because you're starting from scratch. So don't wait until you get to the very end to start writing, write as you go. Gather scenes and colors from the interviews, not just the facts. What I mean by that is I once interviewed a guy who was running from school board. And so I'm looking around this house and, and you know, I'm noticing a pattern here. So then I excused my, I asked him, could I use his bathroom? Went to the bathroom just to look around. I didn't really need to use the bathroom. So I came back out and the, the thing was that he's running from school board, but I didn't see like one book in his house, like not even a magazine. It's like, so like no curiosity, like nothing. And so, yeah, no, I did not check his bedroom. So maybe he was reading something in there, but, but it just, it was just like something that just struck me that there's no bookshelves, there's no nothing, but here's this guy who's running for school board. Um, think about the story structure as you go too, because depending on what kind of information you get, that will dictate the form of the story. You know, you need a lot more information to write a narrative investigation than you do a straight hard news lead. Because with a narrative, you're setting scenes, you've got characters, you've got dialogue. So you need a lot more when you're doing that. So think about the story, the structure as you go. And then remember the readers. This is something that, you know, we, we put a lot of energy into gathering all the facts. And then at the very end, we write it, but we don't put the same information, we don't put the same energy into compiling the story that we do in gathering all the information. So the product is not as good as the ingredients. And, and you know, walk the reader through the story, explain things to them so that they, that they get what you're trying to say because they shouldn't have to wade through the stuff to figure out what it is that you're trying to, trying to say. I was just reading a, a study um, and for the life of me, I could not understand what it is that they were trying to prove because it was just so dense. If I have to work that hard, I'm just gonna stop reading and readers are the same way. It's, that's just the way we're all like that. So as you're doing this, make sure that you check your sources and your documents. So you background your sources to make sure that they actually know what they're talking about. When I worked at the Minneapolis Star Tribune years ago, you know, I worked with this reporter named Mark Bronswick and we had a story that was done um, for like the Christmas holidays and um, it wasn't the investigative team, but um, people in the, in the features department, they wrote about this lady who had these shopping tips. And so just out of curiosity, Mark Brunswick, he did a background check on the lady, ran her through all the public, public records uh, that we had. And she actually was an expert on shopping. She had like uh, about three shoplifting uh, arrests. So she did know a couple of things about shopping, not about paying for the, the merchandise, but she did know about shopping. So make sure you background people so that, again, you're not caught off guard when that, because again, just because somebody works at an agency or works at a business doesn't mean they're, they're an expert on something. You can work at EPA 
but you may be a receptionist at EPA, right? You could work at Apple, but you could be the person who works in food service at Apple. So just because you say this person works for an entity doesn't mean that they're an expert on the topic simply because they work there, okay? And be aware uh, that people will have an agenda when they talk to you. That's just the nature of the business, right? Like there's a reason that people talk to you. Um, and some of it is self-serving. Some of it is because they're, you know, they're just want to be good public servants. You know, there, there are a number of reasons, again, why people want to talk to us. Always ask people, like, how do you know this when they tell you things? What documents do you have? Do you know this firsthand? Did you get this from your cousin Pookie Ray Ray's friend, uncle? Like, how do you know this stuff, right? Uh, and sources aren't your friend. Can, can some of your friends be sources? Yes, but mainly sources are not your friends, right? And remember that, to keep your professional distance. Verify each and every document that you get. Um, I got a document from, from someone and it, it purported to be from, um, I think they said it was from the Department of Homeland Security. And so I was reading through the document and a word just jumped out at me, the word color just jumped out at me. And the reason that it jumped out at me was because color had a U in it. We don't spell color with a U, right? That's a European thing for spelling color with a U. So why would an American domestic agency have a document with color in it. And then I looked at other spellings. So obviously the document was fake because we wouldn't like, so authenticate the documents that you get by carefully reading them and comparing the documents that you have with other documents. Okay. And if you're using data, make sure that the data is current or if like, let's say you're using census data. Well, the latest census was 2020, that was two years ago, but that is the latest data that we have. So just say that, you know, but understanding like how data is collected also. To, so a few years ago, um, more than a few years ago, back in 96, I believe, uh, a newspaper did a story, and I'm not going to call the name of the newspaper, but they did a story that said that the city that was hosting the Olympics that year, Atlanta, um, had like this massive crime rate um, compared to other cities. Well, obviously that didn't go well. That didn't go over well with the people in Atlanta, at least the the, the leaders, because. Atlanta was hosting the Olympics that year. So not the thing you want splashed on a newspaper or on a TV screen that you've got this massive crime rate right before you're ready to host the Olympics. And the news organization who, again, I won't call their names, um, but you can probably guess who they are. Anyway, they were relied on the, um, the, um, the, um, the FBI's crime data that they that they pull together every year and um for the life of me it's been a long day and i'm i'm like um drawing a blank here on the, the name of it so forgive me but the uniform crime reports there we go but what this is gets to the point of understanding the limitations about the data that you use what they weren't aware of is that the uniform crime report stuff is voluntary. So you don't have to, so cities don't have to report it. And I think that year Detroit didn't report it because Detroit, Miami also did report because it's Miami and they were probably hanging out on the beach and they were gonna get around to it once they got their tan on. Um, and a couple of other cities didn't report. So obviously the cities having those big cities not report pushed Atlanta up to the top. So they had to do a correction that was nearly as big as the story itself. 
So understand the limitations of any data that you are using. Okay? And, and just, again, be careful when people throw data at you too. Um, you will hear people throw out all kinds of figures. And then when you try and trace those figures back, you can't find them because um, either they don't exist or people have exaggerated what those figures mean. So be careful of just quoting numbers or data that you get from people. Okay, so now we're at the point where you wanna start reporting and just review what you have and write a draft to see where your holes are. Because as you write, you will see where those holes are. And if you don't have holes, then good. You know, if you if you write a draft and you've answered a question and the editor comes along or the producer comes along or whomever comes along uh, and reads it and they only have a few minor questions, then good to go. But if not, you need to go back and report and fill out those holes. You want to write and rewrite often. Uh, someone once said that writing is the art of the second thought because rarely what you write the first time is good enough. I don't care who you are. And I used to like get a little frustrated when I had to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite stuff until I saw um, a early drafts of, I think it was Margaret Walker, the novelist. Uh, I, there's an archive at Jackson State University and I got to see, uh, how she was writing one of her books and man she she must have done have done like 40 drafts on like one chapter and so after that i didn't feel so bad because again she was trying to get the words right and that's what you're you're trying to do there you're trying to get the words right so that there's no ambiguity the reader really understands and grasps the information that you're trying to pass on solicit feedback as you as you write you know I know writing is an inha inherently personal thing. And sometimes we get a little squeamish about showing people our writing, but solicit that feedback, show it to some people who are not in journalism and let them read it and see what they think about it. And if they understand it, then, then good. If not, then you need to probably go back again and rewrite it until, yeah. Ron, really quick, we do have a question from Karan. Sure. Go ahead. Hello, Ron. Hello, everyone. Ron, Hello. it's so good to see you because um, you actually were the first person I trained under in investigative journalism in uh, Dallas quite a few oh, years good. ago at the Region 3 conference. Oh, great. Okay, well, it's great to hear your voice. I can't see you, but great to hear your it's voice. It's so good. To see. I'm in the car. I didn't want it oh. to be a distraction, but my question is, when it comes to investigative pieces, how much is too much? How little is too little? And how long is too long? Mm -hmm. How do you self-regulate, especially if you are freelancing or you are pitching? Mm -hmm. um, and if you're pitching something, how do you know how and when to self-edit with time? Okay, so if you're a freelancer, when you, when you pitch the, the story, uh, if the editor accepts it, they will give you a, a length of what they want, right? So they'll tell you 1,500 words, 2,000 words, whatever. Uh, so that is built into the, the process. In terms of, of what's too much, always over-report. You know, get more than you're actually going to need. It's like when, you, when you're making, like filmmaking, right? Like there's stuff that's on the cutting room floor and it's probably good but it's not the best stuff. And so you want to over-report the story because you want to know the story so well that whatever questions the editor is going to have, you'll be able to answer them. And whatever questions the, the reader is going to have, you'll be able to ans answer those as well. Does that make sense? Absolutely, and thank you so much. That was a really, really great answer. Thank you. Okay, so you're welcome. And great to hear you, hear you again. <laughs> You too. Are you going to NABJ? NAHJ? Sure will. I'll be there with bells on. I'll see you there then. I'll see you there. Okay. 
Um, and the, the next thing, and this is, um, this is what I call the, um, the, um, the challenger phase. So in 1986, the, 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 the space shuttle challenger blew up, uh, as it was taking off and, um, and the reason was the O-rings on it um, cracked and the fuel leaked out and it basically turned the, the shuttle into a big bomb, right? And, and so this is, you know, where I give people my, my O-ring speech at when we are at this phase. Because the thing about the, the Challenger is that they checked everything. They checked every single thing except the O-rings, right? Um, and the, the reason was that no, the O-rings would crack in cold weather, but this, the freaking thing is taking off from Florida, like Cape Canaveral. So when does it ever get cold in Florida? When does it ever freeze in Florida? Well, the day before the shuttle was supposed to take off. So the one thing that they never checked was the thing that led to the destruction of the time. And so the lesson there is it's always that one thing that you never think about. You're gonna check big stuff like names and figures and, and all of those, those things and date, but it's gonna be the, the little things that you just won't check sometimes even like the spelling of names, sometimes the, the person's name could be Smith, but it could be spelled with a Y rather than an I. So ask, 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 circle every fact in the story, every single fact that you have in that story, and then check it, and then check it again, and then check it again to make sure that you have. And always check the insignificant facts, especially those things that everybody knows. Because there's a lot of stuff that everybody knows that ain't true. So always check everything. And read the story out loud. I used to uh, sit near this guy when I first started, and he would just be annoying because he would just be reading the story out loud. But it's a habit that I picked up on because when you hear the story, you can actually hear like the cadence and the flow of words. And if you're reading something, you have to take a breath to continue reading it, it's too long. You need to go back and break it up into like shorter sentences because you, you shouldn't be reading stuff and then have to take a breath to do it. But when you read it out loud, you can actually hear it. And it also lets you know that you've skipped over a word or something, because a lot of times when you're reading it just with your eyes, you will put words into the copy even though they're not there. I don't know if that's, that's happened to you, but it, it's happened to me a number of times where I'm reading something and I know the word is there, even though it's not, because I haven't read it out loud. Does that make sense? Okay. So the finish, do a final check, check the graphics, headlines, cut line, all of those, those things, right? Read your final draft like a lawyer, especially if you're a freelancer. Look for every single thing that could get you in legal trouble. If you're accusing somebody of something, be able to back it up. Back it up with a document, back it up with data, back it up with something hearsay is not good enough because you can be sued. Uh, so make sure that when you are going through that draft, look at every single thing and try to poke holes in your own thesis. Go through it like you're trying to, like you're the person that's the subject of the investigation and go through it and try to poke holes in it. Plan your follow-ups. And, you know, when you are um, planning the follow-ups, you know, when that story runs, call the person who's the target 
and ask them, you know, is anything wrong here? Not like, well, you know, I don't like the tone of this or, you know, you're implying, like, no, like, are there factual things that are wrong with the story? And this is something that we don't do often enough. If you get something wrong, correct it then and there. Don't let it linger and go out because you don't want to do a correction. Look, nobody likes to do a correction. But if you get it wrong, fix it and move on, right? The worst thing you could do is double down on something that is wrong. Um, and so, oops, go back here. All right. Uh, it's, so it's supposed to be, I may have misspelled here, but solicit comment after the story runs. This is why you should always read it out loud because then you see stuff like this. Celebrate uh, for, um, I'll give you like 15 minutes to celebrate. And then let's start planning the next project. Um, so that is like the the end of the presentation. <laughs> I do have um, some other things here that I will uh, share. Is like um, 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 from like the. AP investigations and where you can find uh, some of our, our work here. So this is some of the work uh, from the Associated Press and our, also our, uh, our um, colleagues around the world. So just to give you a flavor of some of the kinds of stuff that we've done, both short-term, long-term, you'll see a lot of stuff here in Ukraine that we've, we've done. This is military-related story by Mike Rezindis, who you may recall from the movie Spotlight. Um, fishing and conflict, China TikTok and propaganda. Um, so just to, again, some of the, the, uh, things that we have, uh, done and we also did a, you know, piece about, um, let me pull that up here. Since Carol we, has a question. Um, let me pop, pop this up and then I'll get to your question. Absolutely. Now, when you say uh, solicit commit, you're referring to uh, comments. No, I, it was, it was uh, misspelled. Solicit comments. Oh, comment. Yeah. Comment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was saying about reading stuff out loud because. <laughs> right, exactly. So, this uh, thing that I'm, I'm sharing here, can you guys see this? Yes. Okay. So this is a piece that we did about missing military weapons and um, it's actually quite, this reporter, Christian Hall, started working on this 10 years ago, actually. So um, it was um, one of the things that we did um, late last year that was uh, one of the favorite pieces that I worked on. Um, particularly this, this story where um, this weapon that was used, nine uh, millimeter Beretta, was used in several shootings in Albany, uh, New York. But according to uh, the military records, it was inside a safe. It was in the armory at Fort Bragg. And so we were able to find weapons that the military didn't even know that was was missing. So one of the favorite pieces that I did last year. I mean, uh, since I've been here actually. So just so uh, you know, some um, bling of some of the work that we have done uh, here. And uh, so now 
totally open for questions and comments and concerns and anything else that starts with a C. Karan, did you still have a question? No, I'm good. I'm sorry, I couldn't put my hand down because I was driving. Oh, no worries. I'll take it down then. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, if you were going to jump into covering a story that everybody's covering right now because it's the hot thing in the news and it's important, what would you do to try to find the angle that people are not covering? Mm -hmm. Well, it would all depend on on the story. So let me try and think of a of a of a story. Hmm. Hmm. We could say the voting rights issue or the yeah, I mean, abortion rights issue. Right. I mean, you know, those are stories that obviously will get a lot of attention that people I mean, you know, I can't think of anything off the top of my head to be be honest about like the voting rights because I think a lot of the stuff has been been done. Like looking at will it have an impact on people and the sort of history of voting rights and suppression. Um, Would you go to all your sources to get their ideas? Yeah, about what it is they're concerned about that's not getting covered. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I always do when I start with a with a project is just uh, talk to people and say, hey, listen, either like what's on your mind or here's what I'm thinking of looking at. What do you think? And this is something that that you think needs to be covered or is not getting enough coverage there. Um, because, you know, I, I I think with like, you know, abortion and in and, one of the things that i haven't really seen so like does that mean like if roe is overturned and like so does that mean that people who actually make legal contraceptive stuff well could they be criminally charged like i maybe you guys have seen that but i haven't seen that so if you're like um pfizer i don't know if pfizer actually makes but whoever bayer or whoever makes this stuff you know, so I think looking at something like like that. So have we turned something that's legal into something that it illegal with the with the talk of a pen? But the main thing for things that are in the news is to go look um, where others aren't looking and to check with your sources or just do a clip search. And I know that we're not clipping things anymore, but just read up on the topic to see like where the holes, like what's not being covered here. Okay, Davis, you can go ahead. Thanks, um, Ron, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to all this today. I've got kind of a two-parter. Um, one is, what kind of things stand out to you on a resume for people who want to join a project driven investigations team like yours? Mm -hmm. And what advice do you have to a beat reporter trying to carve out investigations while also keeping up with daily demands? Thanks. Sure. Okay, so let me answer the second one first. Um, for a beat reporter, like the two notebook rule is the, is the main thing, right? Cover your beat with the, and then fill your one notebook, but then have these ideas that you, right? And then organize your time so you can block out some time in between doing stuff on your beat that you can follow for you. Make one phone call. Don't try to do it all at once, but you do incremental work to build up to the investigation that you are doing well on your beat. But because you are a beat reporter, there is a richness of, of sources that you have uh, too that you can you can draw on. So make sure that you know you tailor investigations to things that are on your beat that you already have a knowledge of that you just want to be able to to, to dive deeper into. 
And then the last thing on that is to, you know, give and, and, get, and get, right? Like if you give your editor something like, look, I'll go do this cat in a tree story, right? If you give me like two days to go do this thing, right? So just do a little old fashioned trading to let your editor give you time or whomever you're reporting to give you time to be able to, to do a, a project, right? Um, and so, so, so Davis, hopefully that helps for the second part of your question. Um, um, it does. And my, my editor is here and I just want to tell him that he's going to get trade proposals from me in that <laughs> Keanu Reeves format. <laughs> okay. So the first part, uh, I mean, of the question is like, what do I look for on a resume and, and things like that? So you know, I I look at people's resume, but it's not really a, a determining factor for me. Determining factor for me is the type of work that you've done and also the the ambition and the scope of the work. Um, because I'm looking for people who are who are driven, who want to to do bigger and better stories, right? And who have original ideas, who are innovative, who are creative. That's what I'm I'm looking for. So sometimes it's it's not even about like experience because you know there are people who I've hired that they don't have the experience of other people that I've hired, um, but they have that one thing that I need. And so I'll give them, I'll give, giving them a shot because I can teach them a lot of things, but the one thing that I need is probably the thing that I can't teach them, right? Like they may have incredible sources that I can't teach you that, like you've got them. Uh, or, you may have a, a technical skill that I need for the team that I can teach you the other stuff. But so that's the kind of the way that I approach it. You know, I, I look for things that, that help better the team overall, that the person coming in brings a skill set that we don't have. But also, again, a level of ambition uh, and drive and energy and enthusiasm that I that I that I, I, I want to see in that person as well. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks. Sure. Russell, you can go ahead. Sorry, thanks. Yeah. Uh thanks, Ron. Uh and and echoing Davis, that thanks so much for for being here for us. And um my question is, do you ever for complicated stories? Do you ever like use a timeline, like 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 as a, as a tool to kind of put everything into its place yep. and see the sort of beginning, middle, and end, and and yep. how useful is that to you? And kind of when do you do it, if if so? Dude, I try to use a timeline like all the time, right? Especially for the stories that we do, uh, because they do tend to be pretty long, right? And so you want to like. And but timelines are also good when you're sitting down and interviewing people. And so it helps to solicit like really good stuff from people. So what I'll do is I'll take a timeline with me to an interview and I'll have the person I'll walk, have them walk me through the timeline and then we'll talk about, OK, but there's a gap in here. Like you said, you did this on May 17th, but, you know, there's a gap between May 17th and May 31st, right? So timelines are both useful for writing, but also for interviewing, because as you're walking people through that timeline, you're soliciting information from them that will help you build out the narrative. So I am, I am totally uh, a huge fan of timelines and thanks for bringing that up actually. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I... Um, I, I use them too, so that's why I wanted to ask and, and see if, if it was just something I do in my own head or if other people um, find them useful. And, and thank you for that. Um, one other thing, one other quick question is about in terms of uh, like when you're a freelancer 
pitching. So like one of the things that I'll try and do is like when I'm pitching a, a, somebody as a freelancer, I'll sort of like include some article that they've done that's like related to the topic to kind of show like this is like, you know, one, I, I know your publication and, and I'm invested in it. And two, it's kind of like continuing your coverage. Um, I wonder if you as an editor, like, and I don't know how often you receive pitches from freelancers, but is that something that you feel would kind of make you trust that, that reporter more? And also what are some, are there any other tricks that you, you think like, oh, this would be a good move if a freelancer were to, to include this in their pitch to me? Mm -hmm. I, I, so I don't know if it's about like including any works, that, uh, but having a knowledge of the publication definite helps right like showing that you have a knowledge of the publication and what it does and the audience that it reaches uh is is key uh i don't do a lot of freelance stuff because i have a staff of like 30 people so you know it, it's but i have on occasion used some freelancers and it's because you know they came to me with stuff with expertise that people on my staff didn't have, but they also knew the kind of stuff that my team does, right? So it wasn't just like they knew what AP did because you know AP is a wire service. So a lot of the, the stuff that it does is like between 800 and 1,000 words. You know, we're anywhere from 2,500 to 3,800 words uh, and sometimes even longer than that. So, but having a, 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 a knowledge so that I, I get the impression that you've done your homework, you know the kind of work that we do, and when you're pitching me, your pitch reflects that. Thanks very much, Ryan. Sure. Awesome. And then Sarah asked in the chat, will the PowerPoint be sent to everyone? Um, would you rather just keep it on your end? I'm thinking of no. I'm joking. Yeah, of course you can. You can have the PowerPoint. Yeah, absolutely okay. awesome. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Happy to answer any questions. You know, anything except for like my bank account uh, number. Uh, but you know, like you know, stuff about my military background. Anything you guys want to want to know? I mean, you can see it from the bio, but. Hi, Ron, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, thank you. It was a great presentation. I had a question uh, specifically about the FOIA. Sure. If I know you mentioned the distinction between the state and the federal, what do you do when an agency just says, we looked for the document and couldn't find it? But you know that's not a great answer because I hear that sometimes and I'm not sure what recourse I might have. Well, so there's a couple of things that, that you, can, you, can, you can do there. Uh, what I try to do is never FOIA just one place, right? Um, so I FOIA multiple places. So if one agency said it doesn't have it, then I FOIA other agencies who would interact with them on that same topic to see if they have it. And then use that to say, okay, well, but you do have it. The other thing is that under uh, federal FOIA, right? Um, agencies are required to put up their FOIA logs on their websites so you can see what's been requested. On the state level, they don't necessarily put it on their websites, but they have it. Though you could also see if other people have filed that same FOIA and what the response was. Because if you've filled that request before, then I want what you've given out before. So that's you know one of the, the things. And, and then, you know, the other thing is to try it in a different manner, right? Because what I tend to, to do is look at, like, what do you require to, to file? Like, if you are a police department, like, what do you require to file, right? And to whom, right? So give you an example. Um, years ago, when I worked for the Minneapolis Star Tribune, um there was a mass shooting you know on a native uh, on a, in the reservation and um we wanted to find out like what how, what kind of money programs and stuff they have for 
for kids on the reservation because the um, the the shooter was a was a kid, um, and so you know their thing was like, well, you know, we're sovereign Eastern, we don't have to really give you anything, and that's true. But when you get in situations like that where you either they tell you they can't find it or you can't get the document. Think about now, where else would you get that information? And then who reports to whom? So, okay, they won't get, they didn't give me the information, but I also know that this reservation gets money from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is in the Department of Interior. So I FOIA'd the Bureau of Indian Affairs and got a CD with all this information on it that they refused to give me. So there's always a way around it. You know, think about just like circling yeah, yeah. The, the thing and then looking at all of the points that you can you can get to. Like, you know, Congress, for instance, right, is not subject to FOIA. Like you can't FOIA Congress okay. because they exempted themselves from FOIA. <laughs> However, if a congressman writes a letter to Department of Labor. That's Department right. of Labor. Yeah. So, you know, so that's how you you get at at this this information. But yeah, you know, and then the other thing is just know the law, right? So you look through like if the agency is required to keep that information that you're seeking, then yep. ask, all right, so under city statute, whatever, under state law, whatever, you're required to keep this information. You've never kept this information. This law passed in like 1960. Right. So you're telling me you you've never kept this information? How is that possible? When you throw a reg at someone, they're going to pay attention too. Because exactly right. right. I appreciate that. It's a good idea. Sure. Okay. Other questions? Um, I I do. Sure. Um, something that you know uh, that I've I've encountered. Um, you know, we try to get data from some agencies, federal agencies and such. Some take their sweet time. <laughs> um, now, I guess my, my question is, it would be, you know, you know, it, when you try to find data in such other places, I mean, you know, and you can't seem to find it, find it, you know, if there's ever a time you, you can't find it. Um, is a story, should you just keep on pursuing with this story? Just, drop the story until, until hoping you get the data. Well, I, I think so. Sometimes the lack of data can be the story itself, right? So I'll give an example. Um, when I worked in Roanoke, Virginia, we, um, we, we did this thing on like ambulance response times. We were, you know, because some people died in a, um, in a, in a, in an accident and the ambulance took however it went. So they came back to us and said, well, yeah, but we, um, you know, uh, on average, we get there in like eight minutes or something like that. So, but there was no data, right? And so we, then they refused to give us the data. So we wrote a story about, they say this, but they didn't provide any data to show it. So we then went through a process and we ended up getting the, the data, but then the data itself was like incomplete because the start times were there, but the end times weren't there or the date. So, so there was no way you could ever, I don't know where they got the eight minutes for, from or how they got it because there was no way they could have done it from the data that, that had there. So sometimes it's just doing a story, just saying, hey, listen, this agency has refused to turn over. So basically it's what we did with the, with the AWOL weapons, like the military, uh, particularly the Air Force, uh, refused to give us anything until we did, like we were like halfway through the series before the Air Force finally, because we kept hammering and saying the Air Force refused to give us any information about their missing weapons. They keep saying that they, are, they, they have a handle on it, but you know, and but even overall, the military was saying we we think we can account for like ninety nine point nine percent of the weapons, but you have no way of tracking them. So how do you know that? So that becomes the story, 
like we've asked you for this data, but they refuse to release the data. So the public has no way of knowing if what they're saying is true or not. And so sometimes you can just do a story about it. So Ron, you yes. mentioned your military background. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, you know, I was in the, the Marine Corps uh, for four years. I served in the, uh, the first Persian Gulf War. Um, my, um, I was 0341, which is 81 millimeter mortars, but I actually served in uh, Marine Security Forces uh, Battalion Norfolk uh, with Fast Company. Um, and for you, how many, how many core Marine Corps folks we have here? You know what FAST is? FAST is Fleet Anti-Terrorism Security Teams. Um, so I was in FAST and then I got orders uh, about two weeks after the Iraqis invaded Kuwait. I got orders to go to Camp Lejeune. <laughs> and, uh, and about three weeks after that, I was sitting in a desert in Riyadh. Um, and so, um, and then I, um, after the Gulf War, I came back and um, I went on I and I duty, which is inspector and instructor duty, which is where active duty personnel work with the reservists uh, for their weekend trainings. Um, and I, I got went on I and I duty because my 18 month old son uh, had to have open heart surgery. Um, and so he, he's 30 years old now, so he's, he's fine, obviously, um, you know, and, um, and then I was going to make a lateral move into either journalism or military intelligence. And then I decided that, you know, love the core, but I think I want to get out and try something different. So then I was going to um, apply for the, the U.S. Customs Service, <laughs> you know, but, um, but ended up, uh, I had been an intern for the small weekly newspaper before I went into the Corps, and so they, they brought me back uh, as a, uh, an investigative, I mean, as a reporter, uh, because as an intern, I covered like uh, uh, music did music reviews and uh, high school sports. So in 1987, my was my first interview in journalism, and so I interviewed this 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 artist, who um, she had a pretty decent career. Uh, I think you may have heard of her. Um, it was like Whitney Houston. Does that name ring a bell? Yeah. So that was my <laughs> first interview in journalism, along with Jonathan Butler, who was her opening act. Uh, Jonathan Butler is a South African jazz guitarist, which is what ultimately led me to write a book about South Africa was because I, that was the first time I heard about South Africa was from uh, Jonathan Butler. Uh, but my interview with Whitney Houston was not really an interview. Uh, it was actually her interview because she was asking me questions and I'm a music major actually. So I majored in music theory and composition. So I am not I have a background as a journalist. So uh, so she was asking me questions like, where are you from and where'd you grow up? And so I'm answering her questions like, oh yeah, I grew up here. So I had nothing when I got back. And so my editor is mad and he made me go back and, and, and interview her again. Um, but yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was a disaster. Um, but in terms of this type of work, um, when I came, got out of the Corps in 92, <clears throat> I was asked and went back to work for this small newspaper. I was asked to write a, a Memorial Day story about drinking and driving. And so the group Mothers Against Drunk Driving had given the cops in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, camcorders, handheld camcorders. Young people, this is like a camera that's not in a phone. So, um, <laughs> and so the cops were supposed to record people that they stopped drinking and driving. 
and then they were going to uh, give it to mothers against drunk driving, and they were going to turn those into a public service announcement and blurring out the face of people. But so the cops gave me the videotape, and um, I was watching it, and I got a call from someone saying, "Have you seen the, the the end of the tape?" And I said yes, but they said, "Tell me what you see." And I fast forwarded to the end, and they said, "Nope, that's not it." So they told me to go to the Waffle House in West Columbia and ask for this lady named Julie. And she came out at the Waffle House. So Woodward and Bernstein had the garage with Deep Throat. I had the Waffle House with Julie. So Julie comes out, gives me this, this like envelope like this with a videotape in it. The cops actually recorded themselves beating this, this black guy um, uh, named Stoney Jones. In, um, and so I did the story and it just went like everywhere. And I, you know, it's a small weekly newspaper, but we beat the daily, we beat the TV stations and it was just, it was just nuts. Uh, but after that, I got a summons from the magistrate because they want to know where I got the videotape from. So I tell my editor, I was like, hey, Mr. Weston, next next Tuesday, I need to take the day off because I need to go and testify where I got the videotape from. And he was like, no, no, we don't do that. We don't, no, we don't, no, that's not what journalists do. And he was like, we go to jail to protect our sources. And I'm going like, dude, like jail? Like jail, jail, like law and order jail? And I was like, no, no, heck no. So um, I went down, but there was a, but there was a continuance um, and the, so I had a bit of a reprieve, but then they sent me another summons for when they scheduled the trial. Luckily for me, the cop pleaded guilty the day before the trial was, and so I never had to testify. I couldn't tell him anything anyway, because I don't know who called me. Uh, all I could tell them was that the lady at the Waffle House uh, gave me, you know, a brown paper bag and also um, some pecan waffles and uh, scrambled eggs and coffee. But um, that's all I could uh, uh, all I could tell them. So that's how I got started in this type of work and did not like it and actually tried to resign um, because I... Um, did not want to go to jail like every time you know I, I did this so i was like oh heck no you know uh but <clears throat> so i resigned briefly and i worked as a security guard uh <laughs> for, for about two weeks and then um this security guard frank he came out one day and he had his lunch box and stuff. And he was like, you know, Ron, if you do this, you could be like me in 20 years. Like you could be like, a, so I was like, oh, heck no. I think between jail and Frank, I think I'll take jail. So, so I went back and, and got, the, got my job uh, back and <sighs> been doing it ever since. Yeah. Although I, I think I would have made a good security guard. Yeah. <laughs> so. Hey, Ron, I've heard a rumor somewhere that you were once a member of America's premier part-time fighting, fighting force. <laughs> I knew somebody was going to bring it up. Curse you, James Laporta. Um, and Sarah Blake Morgan, curse you. Um, so yes, I uh, to pay for college, I actually uh, was in the uh, Army National Guard, and I went to boot camp at uh, Fort Jackson up on Tank Hill, um, and that's actually it was 1986, and I was in boot camp when the Challenger actually exploded, because um, they brought us out in formation, and they were like, we have some news that we want to share, and we were thinking like damn, are we at war with the Russians or something? Cause you know, cause well, the, the Soviets, cause there was still the Soviet Union back then. Uh, but then they told us about the, um, told us about the, the Challenger. Yeah. 
so yeah i i so i have gone through both army boot boot camp and um marine corps okay carol you have a question you can go ahead oh yeah i just want to know when you're going to have your memoir coming out <laughs> <laughs> look nobody wants to hear about a guy from a, a, a my god you have such great stories 270 and 97 people um yeah, I don't think, you know, my my backstory is all that interesting. Yeah. Okay, this is a last call for questions. Sure. If nobody else has anything to ask, I think we will go ahead and call it for tonight. Okay. Thanks so much for joining us, Ron. We really appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. You to everybody for being here. Great. Yeah, a lot of people would love to read it. Oh, it was, <laughs> it was, listen, it is, it is, it is an honor. Um, and thank you guys so much for, um, you know, spending your evening with me. Uh, would have missed it. This was like, um, yep, Gretchen, there you go. Okay, cool. Okay. But yeah, I mean, this is like, I have to pay for college. But yeah, look, I, I love the guard. Uh, I actually did food service in, in the guard, so uh, that's what they needed, and that's what I did. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Davis says that's the most legal. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> it actually is true. So, listen, thanks so much, guys. And look, anytime I'm, I'm happy to do uh, anything for my fellow vets. So, anytime. Thank you again for joining us. And everybody, I hope you guys have a good night. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night, everyone.